Hi. So thanks, Alvaro. As we said, we can just start quickly. So if you remember from last, uh, last session in Alborg, uh, both uh, Jacob and, um, and Fernando mentioned regularization as a tool to, to tackle overfitting and other problems in minimization, uh, uh, in minimization tasks. So the, the talk today will give some more uh, details about these objects. We will mainly focus on regularization that promotes sparsity, and we, wis we will see what I mean by sparsity also with some practical applications. And then we will, uh, we will go more into the mathematical details of uh, regularization and uh, optimization with uh, this kind of objects. We will see some feature selection, and if we have time, we will also try to give an interpretation of one object that I'm sure you already know, but from the sparsity point of view. So let's start with, the, with an example that it's not really related to machine learning, but I think gives a very good uh, uh, intuition about what sparsity is. So take this image, and we do what is called a wavelet transform. So basically, it's just the same as you do in the convolutional network. You use those kernels to convolve, uh, do a 2D convolution on uh, the original image. You do it uh, twice in this case, and you come up with this uh, seven images, you have a low resolution version of your original image and what are called the vertical, the horizontal and the diagonal details of uh, your image. You do it twice so it's different frequencies. Now, as you, as you all know, uh, pixels, in this case it's just a monochromatic uh, picture, so pixels can be represented as numbers. We will have, for example, minus one for black, plus one for white, and then all, all the different shades of copper will be some number in between. So what I'm saying now is, just look at this image. Here I just represented a couple of columns of uh, pixels, and uh, we delete all the, all the coefficients, except for the 5% with the highest magnitude. So something like this. Then I apply the inverse transform, and what I obtain is this image, which you can see is not as good quality as the first one, but still gives you a very good idea of the content of the image. And this is just with 5% of the coefficients of the original image. So here again, I have my original picture, my 5% picture. Here I, uh, I also plot a 15% picture, where you can see the quality is almost identical to the original one. And also another example where I did the, the sparsity trick. So I just took the 5% uh, samples with the highest uh, magnitude, but starting directly from this image without going through the uh, wavelet transform. And you can see that the quality of the image is not as good. So what I... What's the reason of this example? The reason of this example is that images and also most of our data sets are uh, usually over, uh, over determined. We have much more information than what we really need for some kind of task. So the idea is to find the sparse representation, so a representation where most of the coefficients are zero and we just need the few that are not, to uh, represent our data. As I said, we can do this with images, but we can do that with almost all kinds of data sets. Why would we like to, to do that? So, well, just very quickly, uh, this is our typical shape of a data set. We have uh, observations, and this each observation is a set of features a long set of features. So what we do typically, since we don't know uh, what to measure, we measure everything, and then we came up with these big tables, and we are wondering whether um, 
we can reduce the complexity of this table with some tricks as we did before. Sometimes it's very easy, it's just a matter of removing the features that we don't really need. Sometimes it's more complicated and we need some kind of transformation as we did with the image to find out the sparse representation of our data set. So again, why do we want to do that? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, if we can represent our data set with a small uh, number of coefficients, small number of parameters, we can obviously reduce the complexity both in memory requirements and in processing requirements for our task. The second problem is noise. As you know, these uh, measures, these uh, data come from measurement. So uh, all measurements are in inherently noisy. And uh, especially if those measurements are useless, they don't bring any new information to our, uh, to our task, we are just including in our problem more and more noise. So if we could remove those features that are useless, we are also getting rid of a lot of noise inside our problem. Um, then we have a problem of um, interpretability. So what do I mean by this? Um, we as engineers, we are no, not just asked to solve a problem. We are given this data set and we are asked to infer some uh, solution, some special parameter. The idea is that we are also capable to interpret that solution and give an explanation about the phenomenon we are observing. So I don't know about you, but I would really prefer to try to interpret a, a problem that depends just on 10 parameters than one that depends on 1,000 of them. And then we have uh, the problem of underdetermined problems. So, Sometimes it, it happens that in data sets like this one, the number of features is much longer than the, than the much higher, sorry, than the number of observations. So in that case, the problem, the minimization problem we build on top of our data set is underdetermined or uh, ill-conditioned. So in that case, uh, classical optimization tools don't work and we need to put some extra constraints, some extra um, tools to try to find the solution. And sparsity, as we will see, is one of them. So uh, just to recap, when we have a data set, we will have two uh, possible solutions. The first and easiest one is to do feature selection. That means to see if we can discard some of the feature features um, just like that and see if the ones that remain are still meaningful. And this is the thing we are going to see with a little bit more mathematical detail at the end of the talk. And then some other times, which uh, I will talk about with some quick examples now, is that we need a transformed data space as we did for the image at the beginning of the, uh, of the talk to find a proper, um, a proper data space where sparsity makes sense. So let's start with the applications. Most of the transformation we are interested in are what, call, uh, what we call low rank model. So what I mean is that since our model um, behaves very smoothly and changes very slowly, it's um, intuitively reasonable to believe that the model can be, um, can be seen as the combination of modes of some kind of waves that uh, move along the system and combine to give the different observation we can uh, measure. For those of you who are familiar with uh, linear algebra, what I'm saying is that if we take the SVD, the singular value decomposition of our data set, we will come up with few dominant uh, singular values. And these modes can be represented as the singular vectors of uh, the matrix representing the data set. So if you have any questions, just stop me at any point. So, could you, could you where this implies communication? Oh, ah, I just, okay. 
communications i'm not so sure uh, you will uh, we will see anything but now now comes the examples so take for example uh, video surveillance video surveillance you have a camera that is swapping your room continuously so the background doesn't change and uh, it's easy to imagine that between one snapshot and the other, we will not have uh, main uh, big changes. And also, since we are going back and forth, uh, we will have the same, uh, the same snapshot coming out again and again. And this is one reason why we can believe this thing can be modeled as a low rank, um, as a low rank system. So <coughs> what can we do in this case? First of all, any noise in the, in the image acquisition is, uh, is a process that is inherently non-sparse. So if we can differentiate between the uh, sparse low rank um, component of our picture and the non-sparse one, we can identify the noise and remove it. And also, we can do intrusion detection because we can see intruders like anomalies, which is something that appears as sparse in the original uh, data space of our, um, of our data set, of our snapshots, because the intruder will appear just in few snapshots and not in the others, but is not sparse in the, uh, in the low, rank, um, low rank representations. So what we have is, again, three different types of signals. The low rank one, which is the background, the uh, uh, sparse signal, which is the intruder, and the non-sparse one, which is the noise. And we can play with them and uh, identify the different things. The second problem is the famous Netflix problem. I think all of you, if you have read uh, some literature about um, machine learning, you encounter this problem. So the problem here is that I have a bunch of users. They all watch some movies, and I would like to know, based on the ratings they give to the movie, if they like a new movie or not. So here the idea is, again, uh, that we can represent actually all the users as the combination of very few profiles that we can get from the analysis of the movies. So we need to, uh, to characterize a user, we only need a small number of movies that is enough to, uh, to characterize this profile uh, according to the, to the main, to the main to the main modes of the system, and we do not need to, uh, to have ratings for all the movies uh, so far. Another example is uh, network uh, management. So again, in networks, and by networks I mean any kind of network, it can be telecommunication networks, it can be smart grids, it can be traffic networks, typically things change slowly and are quite uh, static. So again, we can believe that there are waves that move back and forth in our network and uh, all the system is just the combination of these waves. So why can we exploit this? Well, first of all, since the data is redundant, we don't need to measure all the different uh, possible quantities in all the nodes. We can just study and uh, decide what quantities we measure at each point reduce the cost of our deployment. And again, another important thing is that uh, anomalies are something that happen sparsely in this, in this uh, domain. And uh, by differentiating the different types of models in our um, signal, which is the, the state of the network, we can differentiate between normal behavior of the network and some anomalies, some circuit breaks or whatever that we have in our, in our system. So now let's move to another different representation of, of the data. So I don't know if you are familiar with PCA, but PCA is just a way to try to explain the variance of our samples and uh, the idea here is 
to, um, to take principal component loads, so these vectors, which are, um, which are sparse, meaning that very few of their components are different than zero. Why would we like to do that? Well, because mainly because it helps to improve uh, red, um, interpretability of, of the results, as we will see in an example next. And again, because sometimes uh, it's the only thing that we can do when the number of samples is too uh, low compared to the dimension of the, of the signal space. So to explain a little bit better, just take this example. Here is the classic uh, database of 110 digits. I just focus on the sevens for this example. So this is a just small set of uh, possible sevens. And this, I mean, uh, this is just what they represented, but I consider all of them, I don't know if like 500 different sevens. And uh, this is the average seven written by the people. So if we do classic PCA over all the possible samples, what we get for the first four uh, principal components is these four sevens that we get here. OK, these are nice blue and yellow sevens, but what do they really mean exactly? Let's see if we do sparse PCA. we get this result. So here uh, I, I plot the, um, the, the average seven in the background and just the new principal components, the sparse princi principal components on top of that. So here we see that this is quite easier to interpret because for example, this is saying that a lot of people write to write the seven with the small comma at the beginning, like uh, this one and this one, for example. Others like to make the, the corner on top of here much sharper than the average one, like this, this one, for example, and so on. Another example of something that we can do with sparsity is related to this um, this clustering example. So here what I do, I have 60 samples, which are these, these uh, dots here, these rectangles, colored rectangles, and uh, the samples belong to five different classes. So each sample is characterized by 800 features, but, but just 100 of them are meaningful according to the five classes, and the other 700 um, features are just noise. So as you can see, if I do the classic hierarchical clustering algorithm, if you are not familiar what it does, it looks for the two samples that are, most, that are closest one to another according to some distance, according to some metric, and uh, it, it, uh, it joins them together. Then it looks for the next one which is close to them, and it builds this, this tree which is called the dendrogram and uh, uh, where the height of this brace means the distance between, uh, the, between the samples and the, uh, and the small clusters that you are, form, uh, that you are uh, forming as you go along. So as you can see, classical clustering on this example doesn't work because it doesn't differentiate the classes very well. So now, before doing this, uh, we take and we apply some, uh, mm, some, uh, sorry, some uh, sparsity promoting algorithm on the features. What we get is these weights. So it tells us, give a lot of importance to the first 100 uh, features and none to the others. And we apply the same algorithm again. And this is what, what we obtain. Here you can see that now the classes are perfectly recognized and also that it recognizes that the distance between the different uh, points is much closer and the dendrogram appears much, uh, much shorter, much... Uh, and that's it. Okay, so if you have any questions so far, because then we go to the mathematical part and... <laughs> okay. okay. 
So now we are focusing just on the problem of feature selection. So I have a lot of features and would, I would like to know which ones we, we can keep and which others are meaningless for our problem and we can discard them. So let's see how we can do that. Fortunately, most of the problems in, uh, with big data models turn out to be just some uh, uh, convex optimization problems where we have to minimize a cost, uh, minimize a distance, uh, maximize some reward or something like this. So when we talk about convex optimization problems, we mean that we have problems where the, um, where the objective function f, so our loss, our distance, our reward, is convex, and there's also a feasible set, which is a convex set. And we would like to understand which point inside the convex set gives us the minimum value of the objective function. The good thing about this problem is that they, only, they always have a solution and that typically we have fast algorithms that converge to that solution. We are not going into all the details of uh, convex minimization, but one important thing that I would like you to remember for the slides that are coming later on is that when you have this type of problems, so you have a function that you want to minimize, a convex function that you want to minimize, and uh, you are constraining to a feasible set, which is a convex set. The solution is always fine. Well, it's typical, ex except for some cases where the minimum of the function is inside the, the feasible set, but which is not uh, what you typically have in, in practice. So the solution is always fine on the border of the convex set in a point where it is tangent to one of the level sets of your uh, objective function. By level set, I mean all the points that are less or equal to a given, to a given number. Is this point clear? Because it will be very important later. So in the case where this set is given uh, as Again, as a level set, so you have another convex function G, which is supposed to be less than C. This same property says that the uh, gradient computed at this point for the function G is, is parallel but with opposite sign to the, um, to the gradient of the function at the same point. In this case, the, the constant, I mean, they can have different magnitude, but the direction is opposite one to another. So the same thing is if instead of using the uh, constrained form of our problem, we use the Lagrangian form of our problem. So we relax this constraint and we move it together with the objective function with some coefficient, positive coefficient uh, lambda here, which is called the Lagrangian multiplier. And again, in this case, the solution is found at some point where the, um, levels, the level set of the uh, second function G, which is the regularizer, is tangent to the uh, level set of the objective function. And in this case, yes, the two, um, the two gradients should be opposite and of same magnitude one to another. So this is an empirical proof, a very, a very, a very quick uh, explanation of why the Lagrangian form is equivalent to the constraint form. Okay, so let's see how we can apply it to our uh, minimization problems and especially how we can use it to uh, enforce sparsity in our, um, in our system. So let's start from uh, a very simple problem, which is linear regression, 
We have our observation, so this is a, a label, a, a supervised uh, training problem. We have our observations, which consist of the label Y and a set of features. And we would like to express our label Y as a linear combination of our coefficients. So we would like to see if it's possible to write Y as the weighted sum of uh, the features X and we would like to know which are the uh, parameters A. The set of parameters must be constant along all the observations. So A1, A2, A2 um, to AP should be the same for all the sets of uh, uh, observations I. And we do that by minimizing a loss function just take the difference between the original label and the estimated label, and we try to minimize this function. So just to be a little bit more concrete, let's focus on the um, quadratic loss. So the mean square error, what we do, I guess we can just talk about the, in the matrix form, we take the vector of labels y, we subtract this product between our features and the parameters A, and we take the norm to square of, of the problem. And we try to minimize this quantity and see uh, which is the value of the, uh, the vector A that minimizes this quantity. So all fine if the matrix X is tall, so if we have more observation than parameters, but what happens if this matrix is fat? and the number of, um, of parameters is higher than the number of observations. In that case, we have infinite solution. So we have two different problems. Which one of those infinite solutions do we keep? And how do we interpret that? So let's see if sparsity can come to help us with this problem. So one possible uh, thing to do is to say, OK, I, will, I would like that most of our parameters A are equal to 0, and just a little, um, a little fraction of them is different than 0. So with this, I'm saying that the number of, uh, um, of elements of A that are different than 0 is upper bounded by S. Is the best subset? What, sorry? Best subset selection, if you want, yes. So any idea on why this approach wouldn't work very well? It search for all S, S, S. Exactly. It's a combinatorial problem. It's not a convex problem anymore. We would need to do, uh, so P at size uh, A at size P, so we need um, binomial coefficient p over s uh, test and we would l uh, need to go through over them to find the solution so this is not practical in except for very small uh, p and very small s this is not practical in uh, uh, in the real world so let's see what happens when we relax this constraint and we write it with the norm one um, Norm one. So what we are doing here is just taking the sum of the magnitudes of uh, the elements of vector A, and we are limiting it with the, uh, we, we are upper bounded by some constant C. Now the problem is convex, and uh, we have an extra parameter that we have to tune our RR training because we don't know exactly uh, what value to give to C, but this is a convex problem. So let's see why uh, the norm one regularizer helps us with sparsity. So if you recall for what I said a couple of minutes ago, the solution of this convex problem, when we have a feasible set, which is a convex set, is found on a point on the border of our feasible set, that is tangent to a level set of, this, uh, of, the, um, of the objective function. 
So the shape of the norm one, which is this uh, square, the rotated square, causes that the solution gets concentrated to either this, to one of these four points in the two-dimensional case. So where just one of the two um, entries of A are different than zero. This thing, for example, doesn't happen for the norm two regularizer, which is just this uh, circle here, where we see that the solution will be somewhere over here. And this, uh, I mean, it's difficult to draw it, but this uh, extends also to higher dimension. When we have the norm one, we will have, we have another example later on. But when we have the norm one, what happens is that in very few cases, you can have a solution that uh, belongs to these edges here. And most of the cases, they are concentrated in one vertex where most of the um, most of the entries of A are equal to zero. So now that we are confident that norm one uh, is helpful and does, and does promote sparsity as we would like, let's see how to solve this. One possible solution, maybe not the fastest one, but it's the easiest one to explain, is coordinate descent. So what we do, we assume that we know all the entries of A, but one, for example, the first one. So, and we solve the problem just for that entry. So, uh, the problem changing from changes from this to this, where R is just the difference between Y and the uh, um, approximation with the parameters I, I, I know so far. This is often called the residual. So, um, now I have a problem with just one unknown, which is A1, and uh, I can solve this. Once I know the solution in A1, I promote A1 to the set of known solution, and I take another one, for example, A2, and I solve with respect to A2. And I iterate along over and over, over all the possible entries of A until I converge to a solution, which I'm sure I will do at some point because the problem is convex. So let's see what we do. We can rewrite this problem like this. This is just a quadratic uh, um, a norm to, uh, uh, this is just a parabola with respect to A1 with this strange uh, absolute value here. And if you analyze it, you will see that the solution takes three different values, either this one when uh, this, correlation between the feature that, uh, that is related to A1 is, uh, and, um, and the residual is less than minus lambda, or this other value when it's larger than lambda and zero in the, in the middle, which is the soft thresholding operator that we see represented here. So soft thresholding means that we first we need to, um, to reduce the magnitude of our, uh, of our input by a, factor, by a term which is equal to lambda, so this l difference is equal to lambda, and then we set to zero all the terms, all the values that, that stay in this, in this range where we cross the, um, the horizontal axis. And this is the plot of the, um, of the values taken by the entries of A as we increase the value of lambda. As you can see, as we increase lambda, all the, um, all the entries slowly converge to zero, and then they start there. And then there's this value of lambda max over here, uh, where the only possible solution is with all the entries equal to zero. And as you can see also, the norm one of the vector is decreasing as we increase lambda. So we have to play around with the value of lambda 
uh, when we are doing the training of our system to decide which is the one that uh, gives us the best results. That depends on a lot of factors and uh, I mean it's not, uh, you cannot choose it beforehand, you will have to do some cross check to see if the sparsity you obtain is the one that you need or, uh, or you can do. What, what's that? Correct. Well, this is just one of the possible solutions of the, of the, of the problem because we are taking a problem with a fat X, so it's an underdetermined problem and you have... Uh, okay. Yep. No, no, this is just a possible algorithm. I mean, there's no... No, it's just the easiest one to explain here, but uh, it's not... Uh, no, no, no. Actually, uh, there are another example later on where I do a different thing. And, uh, it's just to, the simplest thing that you can think about is just uh, minimize over all entries uh, one by one, and this will also converge. So. It was just an easy way to introduce the, to, to, to actually compute, to know why the, um, the, the, the soft thresholding operator comes out from this, uh, from this problem. Okay, so, so far we have compared, now I'm stepping up to 3D representation, so, so far we have compared the, um, the norm to regularizer, which is this ball, which we said doesn't, um, it doesn't promote any sparsity. The only thing it does is, do, is to ensure that the energy of our solution is finite. Then we had the, uh, the, norm, uh, the norm one regularizer, which in 3D looks, in 3D looks like this. And uh, uh, we said that it concentrates the solution mostly on these vertices. In, th in, th in 3D, you can also have solution on the edges, but never on the, well, ne almost never on the faces. And uh, this is to promote sparsity. These problems with the norm one are also called uh, lasso problems or the lasso regularizer. Lasso stands for least absolute shrinkage and uh, selection operator, but nobody knows it anymore and uh, everybody just says the lasso as it is a word. And, uh, but we can do, we can now play with our regularizers and see if we can, yeah. A number, uh, value between zero and one of Instead what? Instead of using a, a two norm or a one norm, yep. if you use a gamma norm with gamma between zero and one, then you have the faces that collapse inside the Yeah, but this is again not, uh, you can do that, but the, um, the problem is not convex anymore. Okay, so you want to stick with? I want to stick with convex problems, just to, okay. I mean, you can do that in some case, but then the algorithms must be designed on purpose. You can, you cannot, yeah, you cannot just use uh, convex uh, yes. solu solution for long. So as I was saying now, we have seen that two different regularizers do different things. And the question is, can we play with the regularizers? to uh, get something different, to promote some kind of structured sparsity in our solution. So for example, this is what it's called the group lasso. Anybody would like to give a guess on what, uh, what's the structure given by this, by this regularizer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, what it does is... Ah, it doesn't select anymore. Well, it selects between this group and this group. So your solution will either have, in this case, 
just A3 different than zero or both A1 a and A2 different than zero because your solution will be either on, the, on this circle that has the basis of the two cones or on the vertex over here. And, uh, ah, yeah. So one example where you can use this last uh, regularizer we, we saw here is when you are working with uh, uh, complex terms, complex numbers. Suppose that you just have tools in your MATLAB uh, toolbox that work with uh, um, real quantities, but you have a convex problem and you would like to know uh, the solution given by that. So the trick is to rebuild our problem, splitting the real part and the imaginary part of, our, uh, of all our features and our observation, and then use the uh, group lasso, so the norm two, norm one, because this is the combination. It's you take the norm two inside the group, and then you do the norm one of the norm twos. If you think a little bit about it, you will see that you come up with this thing over here. And you use that to enforce that zi and zi plus p. So if you skip, so the entry corresponding to this point, let's say, and the same point in the, in the second vector, uh, they must be both different than 0. And then you take your ai equal to real part plus j imaginary part of, of the solution. So by doing this, we are either uh, promoting that both zi and zi plus p are both equal to 0, or, or they are both different than 0. But they, it, it's never the case that one is equal to 0 and the other different than 0. And here there's a list of other regularizers, the common names, so the norm 2, sometimes it's also called ridge regression or Tikhonov regularization. As I said, it's just to, um, to bound energy. Then we have the lasso, the norm 1, which is packed, uh, structure without any sparsity. The group lasso, which is uh, whose um, rigorous form is given like this, and as I said, we, in this case, we are working with groups that are a partition of the set of indexes. So uh, the purpose of this regularizer is to select the entire group, few groups, but when you select the group, the entire group uh, is different than zero. Another way to have uh, kind of this, this result is using the elastic net, which is a trade-off between number, uh, norm 2 and norm 1, which it can be used when you feel that your norm 1 is penalizing excessively your solution. So there are too many solutions that are uh, equal to 0, but uh, too many points, too many parameters, sorry, that are equal to zeros, but you don't have a, a reason why you should uh, apply some kind of fixed partitioning in your system. Then this is a uh, group lasso with overlaps. So instead of this case where the groups are par a partition of the set of indices, now the groups can overlap one to another. Then this norm is not working anymore and you need another uh, regularizer which doesn't allow for a closed form expression like this. It just a variational form which looks like this. And uh, as I said, it works for uh, groups where uh, you can have overlaps between groups. And then this other thing that I put here just as self-advertising because it's that one I'm looking at the moment. I'm not quick enough. <laughs> Which one? No, this is 
this is something that some a priori information that you have about uh, your problem. Something that comes because of the knowledge of the, of the system. No, no, it's not a training parameter. Typically not. I mean, you can do that also, but then it becomes something similar to, uh, to, the, um, to the selection problem we were doing before, the, the combinatorial problem. So it's, not, it's typically something, as, as, I, as I did for this example, where you enforce the group so that they represent the real part and the imaginary part of a number. So the same thing you have here, somehow you know for some reason that uh, that parameters should be different than zero in groups. And this I was saying, this what it does, you have again groups that are a partition of our set of indices, but uh, we would like all the groups to be active, but we have sparsity inside the groups. Questions so far? Okay, so now just move a little bit to the last uh, topic and see if I can convince you about uh, something. I was unsure about putting this topic until the end, but uh, I, I guess it will give you a new point of view for uh, about a, a topic I guess you are all far familiar with. So now the problem is a little bit different. I still have some os observation x, y, but as opposed to before where uh, I'm given the, um, I'm also given the feature, so I'm given the, the, the space where these uh, signals should, uh, the, the signals belong. Now, I also would like to learn the dictionary. So I would like to learn a basis, which is an over, uh, an over explaining basis. So I have more elements. This matrix is again a fat matrix. I have more, um, more vectors in the basis than what I really need to explain the entire uh, space where this, uh, this um, observations live, but I don't know that. So I want to learn at the same time the basis, the dictionary, and the coefficients that explain my, um, that represent my observation in that dictionary. Since this, uh, this uh, basis is overdetermined, I can, uh, is, is large, I have more uh, elements than what I really need, I can do different things. And for example, what I would like to do is that our explanation is just an additive explanation. So I can just combine the columns of W with positive terms, with positive uh, non-negative coefficients to explain X. I cannot flip the sign of the columns of W. I just add, I, I can just add them on top of one another. So the problem looks like this. I want to minimize my least square between my observations X and the representation according to our new, um, new basis W with parameters AI. And uh, um, as I said, the minimization now is both over W, the dictionary, and over A, the parameters. And uh, uh, this basis is a Fed matrix. So in order to this problem to have a unique solution, I will need to add our norm one regularizer, which is also same, look, I w want a very parsimonious representation of X. So the less, um, the least number of uh, of uh, columns of uh, W, I select to explain X, the better. And then I add also some other regularizer on W. This is just to keep the energy of W in uh, bounded and uh, ensure that it doesn't explode. 
So this doesn't have any physical meaning, but it's just to have the problem well behaved. So uh, is this problem convex? Uh, sorry, the F norm is the Frobenius norm, so it's just uh, it's just the sum of the norm two of all the columns of W. No, it's not because here you have the product of the two variables you are mi minimizing on. So when you have something, you, have, you are minimizing both over, over W and over A. So when you have this problem, this, uh, this product, the problem is not convex anymore. But it is what it's called B-convex. If I just look at the problem on W, it is convex. If I just look at the problem on A while assuming constant W, it is convex. So if everything is well behaved and everything under control, I can typically do an iterative uh, solution where I minimize over W then I minimize over A, then I minimize over W, and so on until I, I get to convergence. So let's see what this gives me. This is just a problem of, uh, I mean, you are given, for example, you are even, you will see when I get to the end, you will see something you are really familiar with, but you are just given, for example, a set of images, and you want to find a dictionary that explains those images. You can build, you would like for some reason, but I don't have any practical example now, but you would like to have uh, your images as a superposition of a set of, of a finite set of images that, that you have. Uh, you have a lot of images in your set, but it's better if the less can be used for uh, embedding learning in natural language. For example. For example, you are given texts and this is a set of a dictionary that explain your 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 text and uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm not really familiar with the with the applications. But then, as I said, you will see the, the application at the end. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yes. Yeah. I mean, this is any basis. You, yeah, you, yeah, you are right. You don't know a, a, a basis that works well for you. you want to that you want to learn the basis also. Yep. Well, this is. I mean, the the theory tells you that you will need to compute the Hessian of your of your uh, objective function on all the variables you are minimizing on and uh, see if the Hessian is positive defined in negative defining and uh, only if it is then the problem is is convex but it is well known that when you have the product of the two variables the problem is not uh, is not um, is not convex. Okay. So as I said, um, we if we fix a and uh, we try to minimize over w, the problem can be written this way. And the solution is given by this matrix down here where the parameter tau, you, I mean, this is one possible solution. Probably in practice, you can, you, in practice, you will do something different, like some gradient descent or something. But the solution at the end will look like this, with, where tau is the value that guarant guarantees you that the norm of W is uh, bounded by, by one. 
Anyway, this is not really important. It's just to show you that this problem on W has a solution. The thing that we are more interested in is this one, the problem with respect to A once we fix W. And now the, uh, this is just the lasso problem we saw before. So we can apply our solution. Now I did a little something a little bit different, not coordinate descent, but again, you have our uh, soft thresholding operator that comes up. And you have this iteration here. I think it's called the Landweber iteration. So you have, uh, you have to, to find the solution AT, plug this into our, uh, uh, into this term, compute this term, apply the positive soft thresholding uh, uh, operator, find the new AT plus one, and then go on and go on until you reach a fixed point and you have convergence. So this, now we are using the uh, soft threshold, the positive soft thresholding operator, uh, sorry, here a plus is missing, which only takes the positive part of the soft thresholding uh, operator we saw before. And we did this because we said at the beginning that we would like our uh, dictionary to be just additive. We just want the columns of W to sum, not to uh, subtract one to another. So forget for a moment, well, forget about this second term here, that when you arrive at the, um, at the fixed point of uh, this iteration uh, vanishes, more or less, and focus just on, on here. So by solving our original problem, which I recall you, sorry, now I spoiled my thing. By solving our uh, original problem here, what we ended up is here, where we have the solution, it says that the parameters of our uh, representation is just given by the same dictionary we are computing in the previous step, multiplied by the input, and then we apply this non-differentiable function here, which only takes the positive part, a part of some uh, bias, which only takes the positive part of our, um, of the product WTX. So does this ring any bell? What, what? Do you recognize this type of structure in something that you have already seen before? This is the ReLU and the entire problem. This is just the autoencoder. You have W transpose here, W here. You have your ReLU here in the hidden layer. And uh, yeah, so this is just another interpretation of the autoencoder that tells you that with this ReLU thing, we are just uh, enforcing some sparsity in the, in the number of, uh, of columns of W we are using to, to represent our input text. Correct. Uh, so what creates the sparsity in this structure? The, the sparsity is, is here. So what, what I'm saying is that what the, this is just an interpretation to say that the ReLU, what it does here is that of all the columns of W, which are all the possible uh, coefficients that you are taking here, for each x, it only totally selects a few of them. The other ones, because of this uh, operator, well, we, you, can, you, lo you can look at it in both ways, are just set to zero. So each x here, the estimation you do about your input, only depends on few columns of W, not on all of them.
start the A plus some element in noise with special path. So normally in the communication we have zero zero four thing. I think it's somehow similar to zero four. But we put some constraint on the number of channel we want to access it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it for me. So just to summarize, uh, I hope I convinced you that sparsity, I'm not saying that sparsity has to be used anywhere, just that it's a tool that is nice to keep uh, in your pocket and, uh, um, and use it sometimes if it can help you to reduce the complexity of your problem uh, or it can help you to solve problems that otherwise are ill-conditioned and you will come up with uh, a lot of different solutions that you are not uh, comfortable with. It can give you some interpretation of the results. And uh, now we have some time for questions or if you need the scripts of the examples or reference, well references actually I've listed uh, a couple of them here. But for anything just uh, drop me an email. Uh, is it something, uh, so can you show me the slides for this? So uh, when you put the Provenius node to be less or equal to one, is it something special with this one? Or you can no, one? you can choose. I mean, this is just, you can choose, for example, other things that come to my mind instead of uh, enforcing a, a, a global constraint on the entire energy of W. You can just say that all the columns of W should have uh, bounded energy. So instead of doing this, you have WI in norm 2 uh, less than 1. No, no, no. W is not sparse. W is dense. The only thing that is sparse is A. So W is actually, in the case of um, image processing, I had an example, but I didn't uh, put it in the, in the things. So you just um, fed the, the system with images. You came up with Strum with some uh, with a dictionary of strange images that don't are not really meaningless. But if you combine it, you superimpose them one to the other, you get your original images. This last example. No, 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 ah, no. in general. So uh, I've been using it for uh, non-orthogonal ma massive access. Typically, let's go to the, oh, sorry. In case in exactly. So uh, you can assume that all, uh, all your uh, users have a signature. So the columns of X are just the signature that uh, helps you identify the user that is transmitting the, the, the information, which is the symbol contained in A. But since you have a non-orthogonal massive access, you have more users than what this matrix is fed, meaning that you have more users than what your uh, CDMA-like uh, thing can, can help you to differentiate, to isolate. But if you know that uh, most of the users are silent at any given, uh, for any given snapshot, you can use this, these tricks to, to, to identify which, which, users are t which users are transmitting and which not. The other thing uh, that uh, El Elizabeth was saying is uh, channel estimation. Again, you can, uh, this is why we were studying this strange norm because uh, when 
you have a signal that you know it's uh, time either both well both time and frequency well either one space. of the two yeah uh, angular, space. angular space for example but it's um, I mean it's sparse but it's concentrated somewhere it's uh, it's not mm, it doesn't occupy the entire your entire uh, signal space but you know that the response of the signal is concentrated somewhere but you don't know because of the delays and uh, synchronization issues you don't know exactly where you can find it so you need some kind of uh, of structure sparsity with some I, I can show you later in the what what sorry? The auto encoder structure mm -hmm. is being used for sparse channel estimation. Ah, this I didn't see it, but or for so CSI feedback when you have sparsity of channel things like this. Yeah. Anyone working from the US ask anyone working with sparse data? Yeah, actually I yeah, work. You are? Yeah, but different from this. I'm I'm working Parse what? Point cloud. Oh. Yeah, which is coming from a radar. So it's not in that time. Well, but I, 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 I guess you can. Yeah. We're using a radar uh, for communicating and sensing at the same time. Oh, okay. But I guess with some assumption, I guess you can still model it with some regularizer or some basis that you have to choose ad hoc, but typically you can, yeah. you can do that. Yeah, but if if you talk about compressed sensing, you are going a step further. So be careful when because compressed sensing is just somehow. Yeah, but they are assuming that they can work on this basis uh, X, so that they ensure that if our original signal was uh, sparse you can still recover it perfectly in all of this I'm, I, I since X come from measurements we cannot uh, we cannot say too much about uh, X and we cannot ensure that it the matrix X uh, uh, satisfies some RIP the restricted isometric property that uh, is very used in compressed sensing and all this kind of <laughs> okay, so we have. Thank you. Thanks to you.